I know we've all been living our lives today and recently. <laughs> and things get real. So we're right where we need to be right now, that's for sure. Just starting our nice deep breaths. You may have seen the wonderful email that Michelle sent out regarding this, uh, our session tonight um, with a really nice um, little article about mindfulness and mindfulness techniques. And the first one it lists is breathing. <clears throat> and Reverend David, of course, always reminds us to breathe. And reminds us that we can tap into that life force. It's always available. talking about mindfulness and really getting into getting deep deep into it into that subject and the whole idea of it so we're going to take a breath in through our nose for a count of four now one two three, four, and then a count of eight breathing out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And repeat, breathing in for four, out for eight. Just going at your own pace. Welcome, Linda. Breathing in for four and out for eight counts. One thing that Reverend David told me and told us a long time ago was it's really impossible to be upset and anxious when you're breathing deeply. All right, we have some more friends join us. Just continuing our breathing in for four counts, out for eight counts. Perfect. Breathing in for four counts. Out through the mouth for eight counts. And this breathing as it feels comfortable to you, making sure you get lots of oxygen. Using as much of your lungs as you feel comfortable doing. <sighs> Noticing the temperature of the air entering your nostrils. <sighs> Just 
Just getting ourselves into a state where we're relaxed and ready to receive. Not minding any other thoughts or feelings that might be floating around. Just allowing, just allowing. There's a concept I believe Reverend David mentioned this concept of radical acceptance. It's one thing to accept something, but radical acceptance is a deeper form of surrender. lovely article that Michelle sent out through the email about mindfulness. The very beginning, I'll just paraphrase, it says something to the effect uh, that we spend most of our day bemoaning the past or freaking about, freaking out about our future. Sometimes, you know, we don't want to admit that our brains when our minds can work that way but uh and that may not be your experience but i know for myself it is true that my my ego mind is often in the future in the past and it's not usually very positive about the future or the past maybe there's things from the past like regrets or shame or resentment or anger. Uh, you know, I think uh, our ego mind, the part of ourselves that is this practical tool that we interface with normal life with, it's this really important uh, tool that we all have, that we need to have in order just to live in society and have you know provide for ourselves for our physical well-being uh that's our ego mind and it's an important part of us it's really important we really couldn't exist without it uh but some uh you know some of the way it's some of its nature comes from our very very distant evolutionary past when uh the world that we lived in was quite different than the one that most of us live in in the society that we're in today and there were a lot of things we we needed to be very careful of we needed to be very aware of and you know like uh the the our ancestors that that didn't have a lot of fear and paranoia might have been the ones that that did not go on to reproduce because they may have fallen prey to to some of those dangers that were there and so the the ancestors that, that we descend from are the ones who who are really on guard against the snake hidden in the grass or the tiger or the all the different dangers that that existed then that we don't have to deal with so much today today. But we still have to deal with that part of ourselves that ancient primitive part of our consciousness of our brain that is so vigilant uh, and and instead of you know when you don't give it things to be worried about like like animals that might be trying to pursue you, um, it finds other things uh, that um, it can be fearful of and uh, build up resentments against and fear against. And it's all just part of our evolved survival traits. And uh, we're grateful for that. You know, we're, we're grateful to be here and 
you know, we wouldn't necessarily be here or be who we are without that part of ourselves. And uh, so we're grateful for that. And, and we acknowledge that uh, it's a, it's a part of us that we don't want to get rid of, but we do want to live in a way that's different than our ego would, would dictate for us because we also are aware of another part of ourselves a part of ourselves that's much more vast and much more powerful and much more connected to the divine and to the universe, the part of ourselves that's at one with everything and everyone and with God, the part of ourselves that is a part of God and that in a very real sense is God. Uh, and that's a part that speaks much more quietly than our ego mind does. And that's why we, as Reverend David says, we make sure that we're prayed up and we are in a daily spiritual practice that develops the muscle, our spiritual muscles and keeps us growing along spiritual path, uh, not needing to achieve anything. It's not about achieving a state of perfect consciousness or nirvana. The main thing is that we just are moving in that direction and we have setbacks and it's all part of the journey and it's not a race and it's not important how quickly or it quickly doesn't even apply when you come to spirituality. It's just a practice. It's just a practice. It's just a, a way of being uh, where we're, we're moving forward in our spiritual growth. So how do we find peace? You know, mindfulness, the mindfulness techniques that we learn and that we practice, like breathing, like noticing the colors that we see around us. You know, one time I went in for a, a, a minor procedure and I was at the doctor's office and they said, okay, go in this room and disrobe and I'm going to come in there in a minute and do the procedure and it was and I was coming in there like wow this is like nerve wracking because it's going to be like local anesthetic and I'm going to be awake and it's going to blah you know and and I went in there and I just started looking at all the colors in the room and I saw there was green on the wall and I saw there was brown on the seat and I just was really looking at the colors and uh just noticing things that I normally would just scan over and not even see and I just got really involved in just noticing those things and sure enough I didn't get anxious and I felt really relaxed and calm and I didn't have to get into fear which would have just I know for myself I would have been really tense and it may have you know caused problems who knows and uh so I was I had to this I had this really lovely experience I never had to get that you know that feeling of like Ah, something horrible is going to happen, you know, and I Reverend David talks about going to the dentist and how, you know, he used to be really fearful about going to the dentist and, and how he worked through it with mindfulness. And so that's something but you know, it's, it's, you know, you're kind of, we want a lot, I mean, a lot of times we're like, can I just have peace? I just want peace. I don't want to live in this, in this tumultuous cycle of fear and resentment and regret and all these things that are can be swirling around inside of us and causing us to not be peaceful. So how do we find peace? We don't find it by bending the people around us to our will. We don't find it by forcing the world to do what our ego wants it to do. Um, we really find it through surrendering that radical acceptance. It's a form of surrender. And the surrender is, is like not what the ego is about. You don't surrender, you fight to the death because it's all about keeping you alive, you know, protecting you. But when it comes to relationships, that doesn't work so well. When it comes to events that happened in our life. You know, Judith was sharing about how she had uh, 
someone in her family that transitioned and the whole journey that she went on with that. That's not something we can control. Uh, and when, the more we try to control things like that, the, the more we build up, you know, this resistance that just causes friction inside of ourselves and, and causes discord. And that's when we end up with these, this, this fear and resentment and anger and, and shame. You know, there's a prayer that some of you may know, the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So those are three things that are not something that that you're gonna snap your fingers and do. Like I said, it's all about being on a journey, on, you know, moving in that spiritual direction. Uh, having the the having made up your mind to take the steps without having some anticipation that you're gonna arrive somewhere, which you never will, but just through your daily spiritual practice, practicing techniques and tools throughout your day. We move further and further along in our journey. And as we do that, new stuff opens up. You know, as you move and grow spiritually, you often get surprised when a whole new unexpected vista can open up in front of you. And you just think, oh, I didn't know that this was here or that I could come here that I could feel this level of peace. And it just, you know, it happens just as a result of your daily spiritual practice. So how do we know the difference between what we can and cannot, cannot change? You know, in the serenity prayer, it says, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I, can change, that I can't change, the courage to change the things I can. Well, how do we tell the difference between those things that we can change and those things that we can't change? That's a big question. And I'll tell you, it's a pretty simple answer. You know, I think all the big questions have really simple answers when it comes down to it. Basically, the things that you can change are what you do and what you say. And that's it. You can't change anything else besides your own actions. That makes it pretty simple. What can you not change? What everybody else does and says, and every other event that happens in the world. Those are the things that you cannot change. So when it comes down to it, you accept the things that you cannot change. That's like basically everything. And then the courage to change what you can, it takes courage to change the way you act in the world, the choices that you make. Because, you know, when we don't pay attention and we let our ego drive the car, it's just reacting. It's just a reactor. It's like, oh, this happened. I perceive that this is happening. A lot of times it really didn't happen the way you think it did because you're looking at it through this filter of threats and, and all this, then, then your ego reacts. And what's beautiful about being in a daily spiritual practice of prayer and meditation is we develop the ability to respond rather than react. And that is very key. That's central, I think, to Reverend David's teaching. It kind of creates, you know, when you're on the 405, the laboratory of love, as Reverend David says, and somebody's driving and, and you feel like, oh my gosh, they cut me off or whatever it is. You're in that moment, you're, you're like, you know, you just you want to say bad words and you say, say the bad words. I'm not saying don't say the bad words. I'm saying just let it come out, you know, just go for it. But then that's when you're, if you're prayed up, then you may have the opportunity to go and say, oh, and what I like to do is to say, oh, that person 
is on their way to pick up their sick child from school right now, and they need to get there as quick as they can. So I'm going to just let off the gas and let them go because they need to do that. And I'm, and I'm not going to worry about it. And, and you know what, I'll bet you 99% of the time, there's something going on in that person's life that really makes it feel like it's really important for them to drive the way that they're driving. And, and you know what, it doesn't hurt me at all. It doesn't, it's fine. I can just slow off the gas, change lanes, whatever. Hey, they, they're doing that. And that's, that's all about them and not about me. That's one thing about it is all the people in our lives that we may be holding resentments towards. One thing that you can realize is that it's not about you. It was never about you. It was always about them. You just happened to be there. If it wasn't you, it would have been someone else. And it's not personal. Whatever it was, it really, everything that everybody does is all about them. It's not about you. So we can change our words and our actions. We can't change what everybody else does and says. But now what happens when we, when we, when we take that step? Now, I want to get deep here with you guys. You know, what happens? Because then you might say, well, I want that person to act a certain way. So if I do and say certain things, then maybe that will lead them to do what my ego wants them to do. Uh, and it'll change the way things are to where they, the way my ego wants them to be. The problem is it doesn't work. You can't control other people, no matter what you do or say. And the more you try to do it, the more misery you're going to create for them and for yourself. And the other part of it is if you were able to have omnipotent power over everybody and get everybody and everything to do what you think that they should do, what your ego thinks that they should do, you would create the biggest mess the world has ever seen because you're not qualified. Your ego is not qualified to be in charge of anything, barely yourself, barely what you do. Forget about everybody else. It's just not, not in a position to be doing that. And thank God it can't because otherwise things would be a terrible mess. I know if, if I could force people to do what I thought they should do, oh man, it would be a big problem for everybody. <sighs> I'm gonna put on my glasses so I can read my notes. So that is why we seek God's will. We seek, we seek the divine will of the universe. When I talk about, um, you know, there's the ego self, and then there's your divine self, your higher self. And your higher self is that part of you. I mean, your ego self is like the first digit on your little pinky. That's how much of you your ego is. Everything else is your divine beingness, the part of you that is God, you know, it's God is your core. And you are the core of God. God is your body. And you are God's body. God is your mind. And you are God's mind. God is your heart. And you are God's heart without getting into like, hey, I'm God. It's just the truth. We are all God. We are all part of the universe. We're all an equal part. You might say, well, I'm a drop in the ocean, but you also, you are the ocean. Because when you come to the divine, we don't measure things in drops or oceans. It just doesn't apply. It's all one thing. And I know we say that a lot, and Reverend David teaches us that a lot, but sometimes it's hard to really wrap your mind around it, but think about it. If all things are one thing, if God is all that there is, then that's all of us looking into each other's eyes. Namaste, I see the God in you, and I see 
you see the God in me. And it's all one thing. So we seek the will of the divine. We seek God's will. That's how we bypass our ego and tap into our divine wisdom. The wisdom to know the difference between what we can and cannot change. We seek God's will. Now, what is God's will for us? What is our divine will? If you, if when you're in your divine beingness, where, what is that, where does that lead you? What is it asking from you? What would it have you do in all of your thoughts and actions? We want to make sure we don't forget to breathe. I think, you know, this is one of the one of those questions that philosophers and theologians and great spiritual teachers have asked for millennia, you know. What is God's will? If I'm supposed to follow God's will, how do I know what that is? As we embark on our spiritual journey, from our ego point of view, how do we know what God wants for us? How do we know what our divine self is pointing towards? Because it's a quiet voice, it's not the loud voice. You have to get very still to hear that voice, but it's always there. And that's one of the reasons we practice mindfulness, because getting into a mindful state can be a really powerful way of tuning in to that spiritual broadcast that's always flowing. You know, God's will, God's love, God's acceptance is unconditional. It's ever flowing. It's always present. No matter how crazy your ego mind gets and how wrapped up in fear you get, it's always there. And there's nothing you have to do in order to deserve God's will. You don't have to earn it. You already have it. It's a part of you. In fact, if God is all that there is and God is love, then you are love. You are pure love. That's all you are. And Reverend David teaches us that everything is love. And when we see things happening in the world that don't look like love, it's a misunderstanding of love. All creatures need love. But some of us get so turned around that the way we try to find love turns into violence, turns into anger, turns into prejudice, turns into all these things that harm people and divide people. But it's all really just love, whether it's a misunderstanding of love, or if it's getting tuned in to divine love and acceptance. God's love is like a flowing river that's flowing over you, around you, and through you all the time. When our ego gets wrapped up in a spiral of fear and resentment and shame and regret, then that is when we stop noticing the flow of love. But it doesn't stop it, it's still there. And the wonderful thing is that we can go into prayer and meditation, which is a form of mindfulness, and we can say, God, I open my heart to your ever-flowing love, acceptance, unconditional love, and I open my heart and let it flow through me. And when that happens, 
it just effortlessly and easily dissolves anything that's inside that, that you're harboring or that's perpetuated inside of you that's not love not if it's a misunderstanding of love like fear disappointment regret shame anger resentment hatred all those things are easily dissolved by God's love and acceptance and because we're not separated from God since God is what we are and what and God is us and we are God we don't have to ask some other being that's not us for help. We, we are that being, you know, it's not separate. And it's not about saying, wow, how cool am I, I'm God, because that's an ego attitude. But it's just about realizing and acknowledging your divinity and the divinity of the world that you live in, everything around you, is all miraculous. The air that you're breathing, the organs in your body that support your well-being, the room that you're in, the nice comfortable place you're sitting, the sky, the earth, the trees, the cars, the buildings, the people. It's all an absolute miracle. It's miraculous to be here right now. Part of our ego is filtering out. You know, it's trying to, it's looking for threats. So it's, it has to filter out stuff and when you get into your divine awareness, you realize just how amazing it is just to be right here, right now, in this moment. It's a wonderful moment. That's why mindfulness is so powerful. It's just coming back, bringing your awareness into this moment that you're already in. You can't avoid being in the now. You can't go anywhere but right now. You're really in a mindful state all the time. It's just a matter of directing your awareness there. So when we go into this place and we're breathing, we can continue that breath practice of counting four in through our nose and eight, or eight counts through our mouth. Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth or whatever feels comfortable. We're not trying to rush anything. We're not trying to force anything. There's no goal. When we meditate, there's no, there's nothing we're trying to achieve. It's not like we're like, oh, I'm gonna meditate and I'm gonna become enlightened. It's just the act. We just choose the action. Knowing that when we do and as we do, it will be for the best. And if we don't, it's okay. There's no pressure, no, nothing to achieve. No one is any more spiritual than anybody else. And even when we are in fear, we can know that it's all according to divine will. And that if we hang in there long enough, we'll understand why. And we just trust. We surrender. Now getting back to that question, what is God's will for us? What is our divine nature pointing us towards? Like we said before, all the big questions usually have really simple answers. And 
and you probably know what the truth is already. The first one is love. Then there's kindness. And there's the children of love and kindness, like tolerance, acceptance, service. Then we have humility. In humility, it really means allowing yourself not to focus on yourself quite so much. It's natural to, you know, our ego makes us the center of everything. It makes everything about us. But when we practice humility, we acknowledge the existence of other beings and we realize we're just another one of God's children. We're just another part, a cell in the body of the divine. We're no better or no worse than anyone else. Humility doesn't mean minimizing yourself. It just means acknowledging that it's not all about you. Like we said before, when we've been hurt in the past, it wasn't about you. It was about that other person, what was, that, what was happening in there within themselves. So we can practice humility. Another element of the divine will for us is honesty. Honesty is about awareness. We can't be honest if we don't know what's true. In order to know what's true, we have to be willing to look at everything, including ourselves. Be aware of ourselves, cultivate an awareness of what's happening inside of yourself around you. When you're having feelings and emotions, being present with those feelings. Sometimes our fear, our, our will to, to protect ourselves and avoid pain can cause us to avoid uncomfortable feelings, uncomfortable thoughts. The problem with that is, the more we avoid an uncomfortable feeling, a lot of times it becomes stronger. That expression, making a mountain out of a molehill, a lot of times when you look directly at something that feels uncomfortable, you see it for what it is, and it may just not be that big of a deal once you look at it, you know? I've, I've, I could speak for myself. There's things in my life, in my past, thoughts and memories and feelings that I have avoided by turning away, turning towards things outside of myself to distract me. Some of those feelings can be so uncomfortable, I just avoid them at all costs. The problem is they don't go away when you do that. And when you start developing this awareness and you're practicing your spiritual practice and you're being honest with yourself, then those things are there. They're sitting there waiting for you. And when you develop when you're prayed up and you and you develop that awareness and then you take a deep breath and you decide, okay, I'm going to look right at this thing. This thing that's been with me for years, 
for decades. I'm gonna look right at it. It can't hurt me. You know, you shine the sunlight of awareness on something like that. And by God, suddenly it's like a shadow. It's not even there. Now, tomorrow it might come back, but that just means we need to do it again. Just keep shining that light on it. That's having the courage to change what we can. You know, we have the serenity to accept the things we can't change, the courage to change the things that we can. What can we change? We can change what we're, how we're acting, how we're, you know, what we're doing, how we're acting inside of ourselves, how we're treating ourselves. You know, when you are avoiding uncomfortable things, you start closing off parts of yourself. You close the door to that room. I don't want to go in that room. That room's scary. Oh, I don't want to go in that room. That room's scary too. Pretty soon you're in a very small room. And your world gets smaller and smaller. And no wonder you're going crazy. <laughs> I'm only speaking from my own experience. <laughs> so when we get to the place where we're prayer and meditation, spiritual practice, we've got tools and we get to where we're going to open up some of those doors carefully, calmly, with courage and let the light shine in. Turn the lights on. That room's the lights out in that room. Turn it on. The lights on. Guess what? Is there anything in that room? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. You might find an empty room. And then you might find out how good it feels to be free. And as I said, it's a practice. I'm not saying you do this once and all of a sudden those shadows are gone. They're, they just have a way of creeping back in. That's why we stay in our practice. We have to be consistent. The power is in the consistency. When you make up your mind to practice these tools, on a consistent basis. You know, I suggest every morning before you even open your eyes, prayer and meditation. Every night after you close your eyes, you're all comfortable in bed, just relaxing. You want a good night's sleep? Spend some time in prayer and meditation right before you fall asleep. If you wake up in the night, you're going to be set up in a calm space and fall right back asleep. Sometimes we want to do a little journaling before we go to bed. What's on your mind? Write it out. You know, I, I recently did something where I, I was like, wow, you know, I'm having all these things on my mind and I'm I'm just really feeling off balance and I'm feeling a lot of fear and disconnection. And Okay, so what are the things that I'm having fear about? And I wrote down four things. And then I said, okay, what would happen if the thing that I'm most fearful about in each case came to pass? Like the worst thing that could happen in each case. All right, there is that. Here it is. Okay. What would I do if that happened? wrote that down. Pretty soon I was like, well, if something like this happens, I'm going to deal with it in that time. And I will use whatever tools I have to do to deal with it. And meanwhile, why am I sitting here miserable, wondering if this is ever going to happen? And 
And I thought, yeah. As I said, it's not something that you just get cured of. It's a practice. It's a journey. It's all about the journey. But it's, sometimes it's nice to get it down on paper so you can really see it and it doesn't quite feel so overwhelming. And just have an understanding. What would I do? Oh, I would do that. If that happened, I'd do that. And guess what? I'd still be here. I would find a way of moving forward, whatever that thing is. And in the long run, it would lead to whatever good was waiting for me. What happens when we don't allow ourselves to move through that stuff is we get stuck on it. We don't move forward. And then we miss that beautiful thing that was right around the corner. Because wherever you are, wherever, however spooky it is the place you're in, you can trust that right around the next corner is something so amazing and miraculous and beautiful just waiting for you. So I want to make sure you don't miss it. And we can do that with our mindful practices, our prayer and meditation. And then just acknowledging that as human beings, we're going to feel uncomfortable sometimes. We're going to feel fearful. We're going to feel those feelings. We don't want to get into a practice of like, oh, I'm feeling fear. I shouldn't feel that way. That's not what we're talking about. You know, when you're on the freeway and somebody does something that doesn't feel good to you, whether it scares you or just irritates you, like Reverend David says, we have the feeling, of, we have that feeling. Sometimes, I'm not saying use the universal finger of love. Maybe just think about it, I don't know. But then it's, what do you do then? That's, it's, if you're prayed up, that's when you get that luxury. You know, there's no better feeling than noticing when you shift your, your awareness and your consciousness. When something happens that irritates your ego, that makes you feel threatened and makes you have a, an emotional reaction, and then you get past it, and then you get to choose how you respond, it's like, the most luxurious feeling. It's like, I, I don't have to sit in this feeling, you know? I can, I can move through it. And it's such, it's like a win, you know? It's like, I didn't let this thing get me. I didn't let it dominate the rest of my day, you know? I moved right past it. Okay, I'm gonna tell you one quick story about this. And then we'll start to come back. So this happened a while ago, but I live up in the mountains and we have really narrow little streets. I'm not making an excuse, but I I was in my I got in my car to pull out of the driveway and I was going somewhere to go play some music and I had I was pulled out of the driveway, backing I was backing out, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna do like a U-turn kind of thing and and there was a car parked across the road that I didn't expect to be there, and I bumped into it, and I put a pretty good dent in the door. Now, in the past, for my ego self, I think I would have looked around and thought, nobody saw me. I'm gonna go. <laughs> and then, you know, what would happen then is, from then on, I'd be like, somebody saw me I know they did you know and I'd be like looking over my shoulder you know and having like a bunch of residual feelings and shame and all this stuff so what I did do instead of that is I parked my car and I saw where the car was parked in front of I went up climbed up the stairs up to the front door and I knocked on the door and I said I think I bumped into someone's car that's maybe is here at this house and that for sure enough it was and I said, hey, I bumped into your car. Here's my insurance card. 
you know, here's my phone number, let me know. You know, I'll pay for the damages or whatever. And the person was a little surprised, I won't lie. They were like, oh, okay. And uh, then I went about my day. And I didn't have any weird feelings about it. I was just like, okay, I'm off to my next thing. And I was like, kind of felt light and like, you know, I kind of felt good. And, and it could have gone a lot of different ways, but I never heard from the person. And, and I think they just popped the dent out of their door and got on with life, you know? But I thought that was so powerful for me to be able to, you know, prioritizing honesty, not keeping, you know. Anyway, that was just something that I think is kind of uh, along the lines of what we're talking about. And let's breathe ourselves back. Breathe ourselves back. <sighs> just knowing that there's nothing for us to do. There's no, there's no requirement to, uh, to, to meet that you're whole, perfect, and complete just as you are right now in this moment. Completely deserving and receiving God's unlimited, infinite acceptance and love. And God looks at you, you know, as you are a part of God, but God, God puts, his, puts God's hands on, on your head and says, I see you. I know you, I understand you, I love you, I accept you. And you feel that feeling of utter love and acceptance just traveling down through your body, through your head, through your neck, through your shoulders, through your arms and fingers and hands and your torso. And it's just like a warm feeling of just relaxation energy. It's a little tingly down through your legs and your knees and your calves and your feet and your toes and it's just utterly envelops you and you just know that you're perfect just as you are and there's nothing you need to do nothing you need to change and you just may decide about adding something into your spiritual practice uh, or just continuing your current spiritual practice, just knowing that there's no, there's no goal that you're trying to achieve. It's just you're in the journey, knowing that all is well. And so it is. Ah. <sighs> And whenever you feel like you would like to, or if you feel like you'd like to, and you can check in if you feel like it. Uh, if you're muted, I'll just put ask to unmute in case you want to say hello or not. <laughs> <laughs> sending you, sending you a hug. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Received. So beautiful, thank you. That was absolutely oh, just yummy, <laughs> yummy, yummy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Oh. And you know, I always feel like when I play music, uh, when I perform music, I'm, it's usually improvisational, and I always feel like everybody that's there, whether they're just listening or if they're playing, we're all part of what's happening and kind of in equal parts and, and it's all about us sharing energy. So uh, I wanna thank you guys for sharing your energy and contributing your precious, unique self to this gathering. And I really felt you guys powerfully and um, you know, it all is just happening with us together in this moment. 
<sighs> what a gift.